Welcome to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. I'm your host, Monica Hadley, and with me today is a guest host whom we've had with us several times in the past, Paul Gandy. Paul is a local attorney here in Fairfield, Iowa, and he is on the board of the Keeping History Alive Foundation, which focuses on the history of the civil rights movement. And that is why he's the perfect guest host for our interview today. We have with us today Mark Paraskia, who's the author of A Spy in Canaan, How the FBI Used a Famous Photographer to Infiltrate the Civil Rights Movement. Mark is an award-winning journalist who spent years investigating this story, which is the story about the double life of famed civil rights photographer Ernest Withers and how a closely guarded government secret finally came to light. Mark is a journalist for the Commercial Appeal, the daily newspaper in Memphis, Tennessee, where he's worked the past 29 years, and he has won numerous national awards for both feature writing and investigative reporting. Welcome to Writer's Voices, Mark. Thank you, Monica and Paul, for having me. Absolutely. So, Paul, you want to start? Yeah, Mark, is this your first book? It is my first book by myself. I did help an editor write a true crime book once, but um, this is me on my own. <laughs> what, whom are some of your favorite authors, maybe those authors who had a strong influence on you? Well, um, first of all, Stephen Ambrose, I would say, was probably the most influential. Um, just coincidentally, he... Uh, went to the University of Wisconsin and played on the football team there. I was always a big Badger fan. I'm from Wisconsin myself. Um, and, uh, of course, I loved his his histories that, you know, just the way his uh, – the narratives that would carry these uh, these wonderful stories, you know, the storytelling, I think, had a, had a big influence on me. Um, so I would have to – I would have to cite him in, in terms of certainly, you know, nonfiction writing. I've heard that name, Stephen Ambrose. Did he write a book on a, a uh, recently on a Civil War general? Well, Stephen Ambrose has passed on. Um, he okay. Uh, okay. wrote a number of uh, histories, um, one about uh, Lewis and Clark um, that uh, uh, was quite <laughs> influential to me. And I actually took my kids on a trip to Montana um, about 13 years ago, because I mean, in part because that I was always fascinated with the Lewis and Clark story, but um, it was a book called Undaunted Courage, and um, so, but you know, he wrote he wrote several very important histories, Citizen Soldiers about the the uh, American soldiers in, in World War II, and um, so uh, I don't know, he, he's a very good storyteller, and he you know, married the the world of you know facts and and. Uh, Good writing, which was is always a good thing. Yes, it is. What what motivated you to when you chose a book? You're going to book your book when you write primarily. You're going to write that book. What motivated you to write this one? <laughs> well, it was a long evolution. Um, I first got on this story you know, way back in 1997 when, um, as a reporter, I, I've been a reporter, you know, all my life, a, a journalist. I've been at the Memphis Commercial Appeal, the daily newspaper there, since 1989. And in 1997, I was covering the hearings of James Earl Ray, Dr. King's convicted assassin. Um, he was trying – Ray was trying to get out of prison. He was dying of liver disease and floating all manner of pleadings in, in criminal court there. And um, I, I – surrounding those hearings, I was interviewing a number of retired – policemen and, and uh, military intelligence people and FBI agents, people who had been had involved in, in the surveillance of Dr. King. And uh, this, that is when this agent first told me that Ernest Withers had been an informant for the FBI. And he told me that confidentially, but it was only years later that um, I did something about it. After, after Mr. Withers died in, 19, in, in 2007 at the age of 85, I filed a Freedom of Information request uh, that uh, that opened up this whole world. I mean, I can get into the weeds of that, but but you know, it it, it was from then that I, it became an, an an investigative story because I found things in records and was able to piece them together. And we eventually sued the FBI and won a long protracted Freedom of Information lawsuit 
that led to the writing of this book. So it really was in, in phases and involved, evolved over time, but you know, it became clear to me in recent years after I got all these records that it's something that I really need to to write in a, in a full, you know, a full book style um, history. Well, Mark, there must have been something about the story that that would that would pull you to do to go through all of that. You know what what was it that really intrigued you that would would ha would cause you to go through so much to get the story? Well, first of all, Ernest Withers is a fascinating character. I mean, even even without this FBI component, um, he, he was born in Memphis in 1922. Grew up there, uh, learned photography in the army during during World War II, and came back to Memphis and documented uh, black life in the South over the course of 60 years. He really is a very significant photographer for the, from the 20th century, perhaps one of the most important photographers you, you never heard of. Um, but his pictures resonate. Um, his pictures. Uh, you know, even though he's not a household name, his pictures are in our subconscious. And, you know, he took some of these powerful pictures during the movement of, you know, for example, of Dr. King riding the, one of the first integrated buses in Montgomery. And it's just a beautiful shot of Dr. King and Ralph Abernathy sitting near the front of the bus and these uh, this whole busload of white faces behind him, a very revolutionary moment in, in American history. And he took this very haunting picture at Emmett Till, the, at the trial of Emmett Till's killers, where uh, Emmett Till's great uncle, Moses Wright, is on the witness stand and stands up and points this long, bony, accusing finger at the killers. Um, Ernest had actually been, and all the press photography, photographers there had been forbidden from taking pictures during session by the judge, but he defied the order. And from the side took this haunting, kind of slightly out of focus picture that is just timeless. But he did that sort of thing over and over and over again, and it became basically a, mu a, a movement insider. I mean, he was trusted by the the leaders in, in in Memphis. Certainly, he knew everybody in and out of the movement, and um, he was so closely identified with the movement. Uh, you know, my my original um, thinking on this when this after this agent told me and I began getting actual, you know, finding actual corroboration of it years later with, through the Freedom of Information Act was, you know, here it's such an ironic story that here you have someone who is so closely associated with the movement. In fact, he's been called by some as the eyes of the movement. And as it turns out, there is also this hidden life that nobody knew about that – He's essentially the FBI's eyes and ears behind the scenes um, for, you know, for years working with the FBI. So it was originally, you know, the irony. It's also the, 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 un, the, the digging out of this hidden history that no one knew about, that, you know, we kind of know that the big sweeping picture of, you know, what the FBI was doing, but so many of these micro histories – we don't know, you know, all this, all of these very corrosive, injurious investigations that they were doing of American citizens who, you know, in many cases were doing nothing more than exercising First Amendment rights, you know, standing up, you know, against segregation, standing up against the war and the, the government, the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover and his men viewed these individuals as, as enemies of the state. And so it appeals on, on many levels, I think. And the deeper I got into it, and I did get in deep, I've uh, so always been a very curious individual, and I really wanted to follow it through to, to its ends to see where it went. That brings the question to me. You mentioned that he literally taken thousands of photographs during the movement, and there are three for which if, only, if he'd only taken three, he'd still be remembered. Oh, yeah. Three iconic photographs which you just described. Yes. Can you tell well, us what's behind those photographs, though, are not in your book? They're not part of your book. I'm just curious. What's behind? The photos themselves are not? Yeah. Yes. Oh, well, they're certainly referenced in my book now, but yes. printing the, fo the photos themselves would require, you know, shelling out some money that <laughs> the, right. the resources just weren't there for that sort of thing. Um, but um, – but no, they they are very powerful pictures, and I think that you know those three, you know, Dr. King riding that bus, Emmett Till's 
great uncle Moses Wright in court, and then of course the, another very famous photo that he took of the Memphis sanitation workers in 1968 carrying the the sign "I am a man." Those three pictures alone, I think, you know, put him in put him in a rare league. Uh, but you know, he did this thousands and thousands of times. Um, took at these rare photos and so actually on the cover of your book you're you're right on the cover of your book actually is a picture of one of those three photographs well the it's not it's not it's it it's a photo that is um from the uh old memphis press cemetery it's it's a similar it's in the style of the i am a man picture but it's not ernest okay. withers picture it's a it's a it's a it's a picture of pe- of uh, sanitation workers marching with um, uh, wearing the placard "I am a man" and then some army uh, army National Guard t- uh, troop carriers behind hey. them because hey, troop carrier, yeah, right. But you went so you 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 mentioned that he you really you went in deep. Did you find yeah. writing this book did it energize you or did it exhaust you? <laughs> man, you asked some good questions. I'll tell you, it 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 definitely. It's kind of like maybe being bipolar, you know, because it's like it did both. I mean, I would be highly energized. And I'll tell you that what, to me as a journalist, it's some of the most exciting parts of it is, uh, 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 you know, the whole journalistic experience is the, the discovery of it. And, and I hope that comes through in the book because it was a long, drawn-out process of finding this information and then putting it together. And at one point, I actually found the daughter of the FBI agent who ran – uh, Withers, a guy named uh, William H. Lawrence. Um, he had passed on by then, but his 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 daughter, Betty, is very much alive and living in Asheville, North Carolina, in the mountains there, in this old, rambling house that was built, you know, starting back in antebellum days before the Civil War. And I went to visit her on a, on a cold, drafty day in uh, the fall of 2010, and she shared with me all this personal information. Um, you know, that, that she had saved, that she'd found among her father's personal effects, like handwritten notes that referred to Ernest by name and by, by his code number, his FBI number, ME338R. And it, these are the things that really, you know, as a journalist and um, I guess kind of a quasi-detective maybe, that really, you know, get you going and, and get your juices flowing. And, and so, I mean, that there definitely were highs like that, just the un- unveiling was – there was also there were also many many lows and, and and just the the difficulty of you know this is my first book um, it may well be my only book but of you know working full time and writing before going to work and after after hours on weekends and vacations and holidays and on and on and on I mean there is no great money in this and certainly i didn't find it you know um some people do some people are perhaps more lucky or blessed or whatnot talented but it really was a struggle i mean it was a struggle and it put a lot of strain on my family life and um just you know very draining but you know it is like i said it's kind of like being bipolar because it was that constant thrill of discovery Mm, feeling you know feeling good when i felt i had finally nailed a chapter right that was always good you know but there <laughs> but there's always that that wall there facing you and almost like um a conspiracy it seems that you know to keep you from writing this if it isn't work getting in the way or family or people closing doors and on you and telling you they're not interested agents telling you you know I'm not interested on and on and on and on until but then you know until you finally overcome all that, and then you can look back and say, "Wow, I did it." <laughs> so well, it was good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned that the the one of the daughters of the agent who actually supervised Withers. What was it? Right, Winter. Uh, Bill. Uh, it, Bill Lawrence. Bill Lawrence. Really yeah, she Lawrence. was very receptive. She was very yeah. receptive in your book, and she and and you also have in your book. Audience should know you have in your book a picture of one of his handwritten notes. So yes. Can see yeah. There yourself. are yeah two pages from his notes, um, in which he's referring to. He's actually in those those notes that are captured in the in, in the pictures. He's uh, Ernest was about to go into executive session uh, in 1978 to testify before Congress, which a congressional committee was reexamining Dr. King's murder in Memphis because you know there were all these questions surrounding it, and a lot of people thought the FBI had killed Dr. King, which I don't I don't 
buy into that. I, I think the evidence is overwhelming that James Earl Ray shot Dr. King and that he did it quite likely as part of a conspiracy to, uh, you know, for money. But, uh, but yeah, um, but those notes in there are, are Bill Lawrence basically, uh, He'd finally got a hold of Ernest Withers before he went into session, and he's re he's reflecting in there. Basically, he'd done a lot of witness coaching, telling Ernest, "You better say this, this, and this, and not this, because we don't want to get into trouble." But uh, but yeah, that's what those notes reflect in there. Um, and there's some personal pictures in there as well in the book from you know uh, Bill Lawrence in his home life with his he he was a pet owner and had a basset hound named Bertha, and she's on his lap there. So. He's chomping on a big cigar. He was a big cigar and pipe smoker. <laughs> You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Mark Paraskia, author of A Spy in Canaan, How the FBI Used a Famous Photographer to Infiltrate the Civil Rights Movement. And our guest host today is Paul Gandy, board member of Keeping History Alive Foundation. Mark, um, you mentioned that you that you believe James Earl Ray may have um, killed Martin Luther King for money, but who do you think paid? Well, that's the good question too, like the sixty four thousand dollar question there, because um, I don't know that he ever got paid. Uh, because the the second you know the instant that the shot went off, the manhunt started right at that moment. There were police all around the the Lorraine Motel that day. I mean, just dozens of them and so ray was very very fortunate to get out of there without getting arrested he was seen carrying a long bundle with his you know he he was he traveled very frugally and um lived in basically would check into flop houses and live in there and he he would carry a, a bundle of his personal effects with him and it was uh the rifle was in this bundle and he he was able to go down the stairs of this flop house which was across the street from the lorraine motel get to the bottom, got out on the sidewalk, saw the police there because there were squad cars everywhere. He throws the bundle in a doorway, gets into his Mustang and drives off. And people even hear like screeching of tires and whatnot. But he made it all the way, you know, like 500 miles or however far it is down to Atlanta. And then eventually uh, got on a bus and went to Montreal, stayed there for a while, got on a plane, went to London and made it to uh, Lisbon, Portugal, and was there for, you know, some time before he was running out of money and went back to London, and they finally arrested him there like two months after after the fact. But, you know, how and why he did this, I mean, it's pretty clear, you know, that Congress reexamined this and retraced his footsteps. A lot of people have a problem with, you know, like, how could he be, how could he move around, like, all, where did he find the money to do all that? And there was a lot of evidence that he, you know, he was a career criminal, he was a, uh, basically a, 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 a robber and um, a, a con man, and um, there's evidence that he and his brothers had robbed a bank in Alton, Illinois, where they they grew up shortly before this. So that may have financed his travels. He, you know, Congress in their reexamination found a group of racist businessmen in St. Louis who had a bounty on King's life and were offering fifty thousand dollars. But there were several bounties on Dr. King's life offered by various white supremacist groups. Um, this has come out over the years. They're very valid. They, these offers were out there. Whether he, you know, whether James Earl Ray had a firm offer and felt he could do this and, and collect the money, or whether he was doing it maybe on spec, you know, on speculation that he might be able to collect later, we don't know. I mean, this, but it's pretty clear. I mean, the evidence, again, against Ray, his fingerprints was on the gun. He bought the rifle in Birmingham. He admitted buying the rifle. He, there's evidence he was stalking King throughout the South and finally caught up with him in Memphis. It's pretty clear that Ray shot King. But the question has always been why. And, you know, Ray, everything Ray did, he did for money. So that's why that's kind of the prevailing thought among a lot of, you know, historians these days is that he was pursuing this bounty. And through this all, Mr. Withers was taking photographs and informing the FBI. Right. Right. Well, you know, on the day of the assassination, um, uh, Ernest was there in and out of the, uh, the hotel. He'd been there for the previous three nights uh, because about a week before the assassination, Dr. King had led a, a, a march through Memphis on behalf of the sanitation workers there, the striking garbage men who were treated so atrociously by the city through like low pay, horrible working conditions. And 
two of their coworkers had been crushed in a in a malfunctioning uh, garbage truck in February, and that sparked the whole wildcat strike. And they were marching every day. Dr. King was asked to come, and he, you know, he was rallying the the workers, and was leading a march about a week before the assassination through Memphis. And unfortunately, it erupted in violence in the back of the march, and there was all this, you know, breaking of windows and police responding with nightsticks and and um, mace, and it, it turned into a really bad situation. So he was very much determined to come back and lead a peaceful march in Memphis, and that's what he was going. That's what he was doing. He had his whole executive staff in Memphis um, several times, and they were meeting with local community leaders in, in these late night sessions behind closed doors where it was very difficult to get in. But Ernest Withers could get in because Ernest was trusted. Everybody knew him. King knew him. His staff knew him. They liked him. He's a very affable, big personality kind of guy that, you know, could just make you smile and feel, feel at ease. And so he's in these strategy meetings, in, you know, in the days before the assassination, and he's reporting back, you know, essentially real-time information to the FBI. These events were moving so fast, and they wanted to stay on top of it. And so he's giving them all these inside tidbits about what's going on, what's being said, and who they're meeting with. And and one of the big things at that time that um, the FBI was was investigating is, you know, of course, the, J. Edgar Hoover's FBI had been after King for, by then, by a good five years. They, it started out as a... As, an investigation into his ties, what they believed were his ties to communism. They, they believed that he was communist influenced, and it was the Cold War at that time that such a thing was considered a legitimate threat. But the whole thing got so so wild and, and, and crazy because of Hoover's obsessions, and he became very obsessed with Dr. King. Um, you know, there was no, even though Dr. King had people, close advisors on his staff who had been, you know, former members of the Communist Party, he himself was not a communist, and this was not communist influence the way certainly that Hoover tried to exaggerate it and made it be. But they did this long extended investigation of Dr. King that morphed into other areas. It basically became like a personal attacks on him where they were trying to, you know, they were trying to catch him in extramarital affairs and bugging his hotel rooms and his phone lines and and it just got really nasty but by 68 you know in in the 67 68 the last year of dr king's life he had come out in 1968 against the vietnam war it was a very unpopular stance that he took um and then also in the spring of uh, 68 he was planning to launch his poor people's campaign which was an effort to bring uh, impoverished americans of all races from across the country to washington Washington to march and camp out and to to disrupt government operations if if needed to to try to get Congress to do something serious about poverty to really take a close look at this and provide relief and so and that was very the, the poor people's campaign was very frightening to the government as well and there were numbers of people even among in King's ranks some of his close advisors who were telling him don't do this. This is too dangerous, it's too loaded, but he was very determined to go forward with it. So it was in that context that the FBI starts really zeroing in on King again. You know, they re-energize these campaigns. They're trying to tie him to black militants. And he was meeting with, with you know, some of these more extreme individuals uh, who were in Memphis. Um, he was doing it because he had been reaching out to people throughout the movement, you know, in in, in – in a solidarity type of effort, but also he was particularly motivated to do so after that march blew up. And a lot of the, some, some people, a lot of people blamed the, the black power movement in Memphis, certain individuals who were affiliated with a black power group. They're called the invaders. They blamed them for that, the violence, even though it's disputed to this day, exactly how and why that violence erupted. But, Dr. King was trying to win them over. He knew he had to he had to have a peaceful march if he was going to have a successful march on Washington, and he needed their cooperation. And they were trying to extort money out of him and all kinds of things. But but he was meeting with them, and Withers and other informants around the Lorraine were telling the FBI about that. Um, of course, now the FBI, the information once it's received by the FBI is 
interpreted differently and what's it seen as Dr. King has lost control of the nonviolent movement. He's going to swing his organization into something, you know, really bad for this country, nonviolent, maybe communist elements, extremist elements. And so that's kind of the context that was going on in those last few days before Dr. King was shot. Did your research uncover whether or not Withers, while informing the FBI, was ever instructed to do anything to disrupt the movement? Well, that's an excellent question. And part if, when we sued the FBI, um, and we got a mediated settlement, we were we were against all odds defeating them in court, um, and it ended in a mediated settlement. And they, you know, the FBI when they released all these records, what they said was, we do not want to reach into an informant file, but what we will do is. There are numbers of records in that informant file that are also appear in case files. Uh, like, for example, the, the FBI's investigation of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference or the separate investigation of the invaders or various peace movement groups. They would always have a file on the, those groups and individuals. And so when they would write these reports, they, there would be a copy list and these files would be copied to Withers' informant file and then also these individual case files. They said, we're, we'll, we'll go through the informant file. We'll find all the case files that these reports were copied to. And it turned out there were like 150 separate investigations that he'd been involved in in Memphis, 150 separate case files. And I got to pick, they originally wanted 35, and we worked it out where we'd get 70, so about half of them. And so we never really got, and we got a lot of good information because of that, you know reports and you know that told us specifically things that he told the FBI and lots of photographs but we never got the full informant file to know specifically that would tell us more things like what he was instructed to do sometimes that information is in these reports in the case files so um was he ever instructed to disrupt the movement per se Still, that's still kind of a sketchy thing, but he was certainly alerted to individuals that they were after who they were trying to undercut, um, and he was, you know, and he was very good at kicking back information like that as far as people they considered to be communist or communist influenced, influenced, um, you know, extremists. You know, of course, the FBI's view of what an extremist was included individuals like Dr. King, moderates who were, just, you know, who were basically trying to push the country toward, you know, providing more fair opportunities for for um, all Americans. And so the, the, the view is very skewed. He was alerted to lots of individuals. There are incidents where, you know, he's giving them information that does jeopardize people, um, like phone numbers, for example. You know, he, he's going out. He basically, as a domestic intelligence informant, he was he was kicking back wide swaths of personal and political information like, you know, identification photographs and home addresses and, you know, names of associates and and including, you know, things like phone numbers. And when, when the FBI would get a phone number, they would, uh, on certain target, they would, uh, Bill Lawrence with the FBI would go to a source at the phone company and do warrantless searches of phone records toll charges, trying to see who an individual is talking to, who their associates are and their uh, contacts and whatnot. And so a lot of this got very, very intrusive and, um, you know, what put individuals in jeopardy. And a good example of that is in 1968, there was a man named Bobby Doctor who was had been a long-time civil rights activist by then. He got involved in the early sit-in movements in the 1960s, and by 1965 went to work for the government. He was a field representative for the U.S. Civil Rights Commission, which uh, at that time the Southeast office was, was headquartered in Memphis. In 1968, as the Black Power Movement starts to flower in Memphis, the FBI has its antenna up, and it, and it, and it, it deems that Bobby Doctor is too close to this movement. And... Th- Various informants, including Ernest, are kicking back information that he's seen at social gatherings in the company of Black Power militants. Um, all this information that they were collecting, they, they took it in a file and gave it to Bobby's employers and tried to get him fired. 
and, and one of the things that they were looking at, there's a re, there's a report in there where where um, from Bill Lawrence is quoting Ernest Withers saying that, you know, Ernest had seen Bobby out at a march and Bobby's married and he's holding hands with a woman and she's married, but they aren't married to each other. And Bill Lawrence is very interested in that and he asks for the photo and he gets it and he clearly he's trying to undercut Bobby Doctor as they're gathering this information. Ernest passed on similar information about a coworker there, another field rep at the Civil Rights Commission, a woman named Rosetta Miller, and Ernest passed on photos of her and uh tells them that she's you know, passes on various rumors about her personal life and tells them that she's one, as it's recorded in the report, who would give aid and comfort to the to the black power groups. And so in a lot of ways these investigations weren't unlike um, the McCarthyism of a decade earlier in, in that the FBI was going after not only individuals, communists more, more so in the 50s, in this case, late 60s in Memphis, uh, extremists, people they, con- they, they considered extremists, people who were supporting black power, and they were going not only after the actual advocates and members of these groups, but sympathizers, supporters, associates, and that sort of thing, and it did get very, very, I think, injurious and, and put people like Bobby Doctor and Rosetta Miller in jeopardy where they, you know, they almost lost their jobs. You're listening to Writer's Voices, and our guest today is Mark Perisquia, author of A Spy in Canaan, and our guest host is Paul Gandy. Mark, would you like to read a little bit from the book? Yes, I would. Thank you for that. And I'm going to read in my first chapter because it, it covers, you know, the day... This is the days around Dr. King's assassination, and it actually starts on the, you know, the, that day a couple hours before the assassination. Um, I've got three different selections, and if I, we have time, I'll, I'll read all three, but I might just wind up reading two. So I'll start here. Um, In the Shadows is the name of the chapter. Willie Richmond logged the time, 4.10 p.m. He'd been spying on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. for over four hours now. From his post at the back of a brick firehouse overlooking the the, the, the Lorraine Motel, the Memphis policeman aimed his binoculars across the street toward King's second-story room. He marveled at what he saw, as if he could reach out and touch everything. The view from the fire station window was very good, he later reported. In his field glasses, Richmond could see a kaleidoscope of detail, the concrete steps, the motel balcony, the railing glazed in a gaudy turquoise, the dark numbers on the door, 306, and the many visitors coming and going, appearances he carefully recorded on a notepad throughout the bright afternoon. And he could see Ernest Withers. The affable photographer pulled into the Lorraine's parking lot shortly after four, the policeman noted, a little less than two hours before it happened, before the world stood still, before a sniper shot King as he stood on the balcony outside his motel room at a minute after six o'clock, a half hour before the sunset. As always, Withers blended right in. King knew him and liked him. They'd first met nearly 12 years earlier in 1956, when the personable freelance newsman had journeyed down from his hometown of Memphis to Montgomery, Alabama, where King would make history and Withers would shoot a photo for the ages. The U.S. Supreme Court had just outlawed segregated seating on that city's buses. The year-long Montgomery bus boycott was over. Withers rose at four that morning. With pluck and an uncanny knack for being at the right place at the right time, he aimed his camera as the then 27-year-old civil rights leader climbed the metal steps of a Montgomery City Lines coach with his closest friend, Ralph Abernethy, and took a seat near the front. He shot a beautifully composed photo. King, slender, pensive, gazes out the window. He wears a stylish fedora propped high on his forehead. Abernathy sits to his left, looking hard at the camera. Behind them are a busload of white faces, an assortment of housewives out on their morning errands, a couple of young boys looking alternately curious and bored, a prim woman in a dress suit studying the passing scenery through the shining glass. At the very back, a white man stands in the aisle. His feet are crossed in a carefree stance, his arms spread wide, gripping both overhead rails. Like the others in this Norman Rockwell-like image, he appears content, seemingly oblivious to this revolutionary moment in American history. 
Through the years, Withers would use his unique access to capture many more memorable, memorable pictures. King, as he preached, as he froze with suspicion when police confronted him outside Medgar, Medgar Evers' funeral, as he marched through Mississippi's sweltering heat. King posed for a series of portraits Withers shot here at the Lorraine two years earlier in 1966, up in room 307. Not many journalists could penetrate the civil rights leader's personal world. The white media found him to be stiff and guarded, yet Withers, always affable, always a hearty laugh to set his subject at ease, teased out another side of King, capturing him in a rare repose. In one shot, King reclines on his bed in his shirt sleeves, resting without a care against the headboard. He stares nonchalantly out his open motel door in another toward the direction from, where, from which the sniper's bullet would come two years later when he'd returned to rally the city's striking sanitation workers. He had all the access he wanted, Andrew, Young's, Andrew Young, King's right-hand aide, would recall years later. Yes, I remember Ernest Withers as a lot of fun, and any time he went to Memphis, he was with us, and we laughed together, we joked together, and he was sort of one of the family. So it was on the day of the assassination that no one, not Officer Richmond watching from the firehouse, not the various members of King's entourage out enjoying the cool spring air, found it at all irregular as Withers mingled in the courtyard. And no one seemed to notice as Withers slipped off repeatedly over the course of Memphis's volatile, seven-week-old garbage worker strike to meet with a tall white man in a dark suit, an FBI agent, who was handing him cash. I'm skipping ahead here. Okay. Up on the eighth floor of the federal building, an austere office tower overlooking the Mississippi River's great sweep past downtown Memphis, Special Agent William H. Lawrence sucked on a dark tobacco type, uh, dark tobacco pipe, and reflected on the many developments. Spread before him were his notes, a scrawl of long, run-on sentences containing the many bits of intelligence Withers had relayed his accounts of the raucous meetings, the shouting matches, the young militants, and a small but titillating detail. His informant picked up the night of that rousing speech, King in the company of as many of a dozen staff members and one unidentified female. Lawrence was under enormous pressure. J. Edgar Hoover's years-long campaign to discredit the civil rights leader had been re-energized by two startling developments. King's hugely unpopular opposition to the Vietnam War and his Poor People's Campaign, a plan to unleash thousands of impoverished citizens in Washington later that spring to camp, to protest, to disrupt government operations if necessary until officials did something substantial to end poverty. Hoover wanted dirt, something good, something to finally knock the wind out of King. Lawrence had seen Her Hoover's fervor for King before. The agent had opened a file on the civil rights leader back in 1965, trying to prove he'd had an extramarital relationship with singer Harry Belafonte's first wife, Marguerite, an attractive movement volunteer. The salacious tidbit never amounted to anything, just third-hand gossip, a tale Lawrence picked up from two of his racial sources, Memphis activists who'd heard it through the movement grapevine. Unreliable or not, it didn't matter. When his report hit Washington, Lawrence was ordered to press his sources for more. Agents in New York and Atlanta were put on it, too. Those were the weeks after King won the Nobel Peace Prize. Hoover was enraged. King, a degenerate. How could they give him the Nobel Prize? So Lawrence went back. The story was the same. Several years earlier, King was said to have been infatuated with Mrs. Belafonte. He made an utter fool of himself following her from city to city, Lawrence reported, but it was just gossip. His sources knew nothing. Now at 48, the square-jawed Lawrence knew his career was winding down. He'd seen incredible highs and lows over his 24 years with the FBI. Virtually, virtually all of it served in Memphis in internal security, chasing communists, radicals, and other Americans viewed by Hoover as real or potential domestic enemies. In 1954, Lawrence arrested Junius Scales, a wealthy Communist Party USA organizer who'd been in hiding for years, a huge coup. Lawrence was a legend in Memphis. 
He and his colleagues shattered the Communist Party there, driving the few surviving members underground or out of Tennessee altogether. In later years, as the social upheaval, upheaval of the 1960s took root, his focus shifted. He fixed his attention on militancy and the civil rights movement and the new left, a long list of extremists, agitators, peace activists, draft dodgers, black power advocates, student reformists, hippies, and revolutionaries, people Hoover thought were pushing the country to the brink. King was one of them. The civil rights leader seldom came to Memphis. Consequently, the FBI's local security file on him never grew very thick. Even now, following his return to the city a day earlier, on April 3rd, he was elusive. Undercover police had followed him from the airport, but a carload of angry supporters cut them off, stalling the pursuit. Running all day from meeting to meeting, King gave a mesmerizing speech that night. He spoke as a rainstorm thundered outside, seeming to prophesy his own death. I just want to do God's will, and he's allowed me to go up to the mountain, and I've looked over and I've seen the promised land, King said, swaying to his own hypnotic cadence. Nearby, Wither shot pictures from his spot in the media pack. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. But then he disappeared again, for hours, nothing. All night, no one seemed to know where he was. Still, things were moving fast. Between King's return and the chaotic pace of the sanitation strike, the daily marches, the frequent clashes with police, Lawrence had more than he could keep watch over. But as the April 4th sun fell toward the Mississippi's flat west bank across from the federal building, he had his best racial informant on the case. Do I have time for one last <laughs> bit? Uh, now let's stop there because I know we have a number of questions. Okay, still. sure. Okay. Yeah. You, you mentioned that Withers was just about like what they call, I guess, a tour photographer. He had yeah. access to the inner circle. He was part of the inner circle. So the question comes up, was he a traitor to the movement? What's his, what's history going to say about him? We're just we're not that far removed, but we are we are, we are right. fifty years removed. What's history going to say about? Him? What do you think? As well, someone who's delved del- del- yeah. deep into this area, I have tried not to judge Ernest Withers. Um, I I think you know it's it's pretty clear to me he had multiple motives for doing this, and and a key one being money. Um, my original source told me that. You know, point blank, Ernest was in it for the money. That was his take on it. But Ernest had eight children to feed, a big family. He was a good family man, and he always took care of them. So I think the money was was an important thing. But then, too, you got to consider the times is that, you know, Ernest was a, was a World War II veteran, and he was good 10 to 20 years older than many of the people he was informing on. I don't think he had a big problem with, you know, certain aspects of this, like, you know, like targeting communists or, or people who were what he called confrontationalists. The, you know, the whole direct action movement, this idea of, you know, pushing things forward through, you know, first the sit-ins, then the freedom rides, you know, the marching, kind of more aggressive tactics, they weren't hugely popular, even among African Americans in many instances. You know, people try to say differently now, but I mean, when you go back and look at this, there, there, there was not a lot of wide support, particularly in Memphis. Memphis was a, was a, was a, the movement there was controlled by the NAACP. They were very cautious. They, they, they believed, uh, they, they favored, you know, winning civil rights in court, you know, through litigation, kind of the slow wheels of justice turning. Um, they didn't wholeheartedly support a lot of these things that were going on. In other parts of the country, you know, the Nashville sit-in movement and, and the, the Freedom Rides and whatnot. And a lot of this stuff was very scary to them. And, and I think that affected Ernest's uh, view as well. So, um, and, and particularly when it came to the, the Vietnam War, um, you know, Ernest was a World War II veteran. And he was heavily invested in the military. By the mid to late 60s, he has three sons in the armed services and one in the front lines of Vietnam. So, I don't think that again, like you know, he he informed heavily on on the peace movement in Memphis and gave them lots of detail on that. I don't think it was a problem for him, as it, it would have been for many Americans. Even though you know now, um, in hindsight, we look back at that war as an unjust war. At the time, it was you know supported by most Americans and, and, and including most, if not you know many many 
African Americans. So, so are you saying that that Ernest felt what he was doing was patriotic? I think so. Yes, I think that factored into it. Definitely so. But then another thing too uh, is, you know, Ernest always wanted to be a cop. He, in fact, he was a policeman in Memphis uh, in 19, from 1948 to 1951 after he got back from the war. He was part of what they called the Original Nine, the first African-American recruit class in the 20th century. Um, you know, the, the city finally caved in and hired some black police officers because of its atrocious history of, of brutality in the, in the black community. And Ernest was one of the Original Nine. That didn't work out for him. He caught some petty corruption at that time. He was, uh, you know, consorting with a, a bootlegger selling whiskey on the side, and he got caught. And, you know, after the civil rights era, Wayne, you know, Ernest became a policeman again. He was a state grade working for the Alcoholic Beverage Commission uh, in Tennessee and with the nightclubs, and he got caught up in corruption again. I mean, a very big scandal this time, the clemency for cash uh, scandal where, you know, the, it brought down the whole Governor Ray Blanton's administration. They were, they were selling pardons and clemencies and whatnot for 10, 20,000, sometimes $80,000 to murderers and robbers and other serious convicts. And so, but, you know, so, but Ernest, you know, he wanted to be a police officer, was in two different periods of his life. And actually at one point in the, like 1974, he was elected, uh, Shelby County Constable, which was kind of a nominal law enforcement position with no real power, but, you know, some law enforcement capabilities. So he always wanted to be a policeman. So I think those three things are, you know, the money, ideology to a point, and his long ambition to be a police officer were what, what drove him for, to work, you know, to collaborate with the FBI. Yeah, The FBI, it sounds like, did a lot of the editing for you in not releasing information about, not releasing information from uh, Withers' file. What did you edit out of the book? Um, <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, and of course, there's, um, the files go from 1958 to 1976, and there's a lot of material in there. Um, I tried to focus on the development of him, you know, as he was recruited, his initial work in 1958, and it's kind of sketchy between 58 and 61, and then when he really gets going in 1961 through, um, you know, when the, when the movement starts to blossom, and as he, you know, his role shifts over time, uh, 1967, after in the wake of, you know, the riots that shook up the country in, in Watts and in 65, and then uh, Newark and Detroit, in 67, the FBI really tries to, to beef up what it, what it called a ghetto informant program, and that was, you know, supposed to be, to detect potential violence and detect extremists and that sort of thing. And so he, you know, gets very much involved in that as well. Um, so I, there's only so much room in a book, obviously. So I mean, I don't know, you know. What did I edit out of it? Um, I tried to cover those critical years, you know, intensely, 58 through the 70, and then even up into 74 when by, by then they, they tweaked his code number from ME338R, R for racial informant, to E, extremist informant, in 1971. So he's focusing at that point almost exclusively on um, – Black power militants, but again, you got to put an asterisk by it. I mean, the, he he was focusing on the remnants of the invaders, that homegrown black power group, which had been eviscerated by that point by the FBI. Um, the Black Panthers, he's very much involved with the Black Panthers, um, and also the revived the the revived Communist Party in Memphis, and he's close to. And they're young college age activists, but he's close to all of them, and so I tried to. I tried to cover those years. Um, I mean, there's all kinds of rabbit trails that you could go down to. In, in, I mean, there's there's hundreds and hundreds of pages of information and photos. So, I mean, certainly someone else could take take pieces of it and, and dig deeper. Mark, did you have any help with this research, going through all these not, files? Well, 
not really in the sense of like a, a, a partner, a journalistic partner. I did get a lot of uh, a lot of help from experts um, back in, and a critical one being David Garrow, um, who was the uh, you know won a Pulitzer Prize, you know, for *Burying the Cross*, a biography of Martin Luther King, and also wrote a, a real watershed book uh, in 1981, *The FBI and Martin Luther King Jr.*, which was basically the, the FBI's Hoover's obsession with Dr. King and the details of that. I met David, you know, when I was covering James Earl Ray's hearings way back in 1997, and you know we've kept up over the years. I think he's a brilliant guy, and he knows. I mean, he he's one of the foremost authorities on this very arcane subject of FBI surveillance of the in the civil rights era, and so he was quite helpful to me, especially trying to figure things out when I when I first ran across Withers' code number, which a censor had failed to redact from a report. I knew enough at that point, you know, that was 2009. I recognized it as, an, as a code number, but then what to do with it? I mean, th th there were all kinds of hurdles in this. And he had a much greater familiarity with, you know, the protocol of FBI files that he helped me with. And then also, Ethan the Theo Harris, um, another, you know, I'm leading expert in that uh, the FBI surveillance of that period. He was very helpful to me. Uh, he wrote a book called Spying on Americans, among m many other books that he's written. Um, retired Marquette University professor. Um, you know, it was it was I were I got a lot of help from from people with expertise and also former agents. You know, who knew a lot about the surveillance. You can tell me, you know, how it worked. Mark, did some of, of these people that that Ernest. Um reported on, informed on, when they found out, which obviously didn't happen until much, much, much later, did they feel betrayed? Some did and some didn't. Um, you know, a lot of people in Memphis didn't really seem to be that bothered by it. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that is because he was a hometown hero and beloved. And, you know, Memphians, they're a very forgiving people. I mean, uh they they didn't seem to be to be that vexed by this dick gregory the um the uh, comedian activist who passed away recently i mean he basically called ernest withers judas um uh the army bailey uh, a uh longtime civil rights activist who became a, a judge in memphis who also passed away uh in the last few years he also believed that Ernest had betrayed the movement. Um, individuals who I talked to, some said, you know, they felt personally betrayed uh, because their confidences had been betrayed. You know, he'd taken pictures of, you know, a friend of his, uh, her wedding pictures, and then was also slipping information behind her back to the FBI. You know, he took, he was our school photographer. He grew up knowing Ernest Withers. He took all, he, you know, as Kobe, Kobe Smith says, you know, he took all of the parade pictures, all of the school pictures, all, you know, all, he was our family photographer. And then, you know, he finds out years later, here he is going behind his back on that. So, I mean, there was a real mixture of reactions. You know, the, and I've tried to, as I said, I've tried not to judge Ernest. I think you have to try to understand him in the context of his personal needs and his times. And, you know, I think patriotism was a factor. And so, I mean, I try not to judge him. I'm trying to leave that for others to decide on their own, you know, wh whether you think, you know, what he did was, was wrong or if it was wrong, to what degree or to what, to, in what way it was. Um, but, you know, he was very much a man of his times. And, um, you know, I, I, I think he, his, his main thing, and I've said this many times, I mean, he was, he's a, he was a family man. He took care of his family. And I personally, in my view, don't believe that anything he did for the FBI eclipses the good that he did for the movement through these powerful pictures. Um, you know, it doesn't eclipse it, but it does rival it. I mean, this hidden history of what the FBI was doing is 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 quite instructive for for today. And you know, it's it's a relevant story. It was relevant back then. It's relevant today. It will be relevant a hundred years from now because you're always going to have this kind of natural tension in this country if we have true democracy of, you know. The law enforcement trying to keep order, trying to protect the country, and then bumping heads up against people who want change, who want, who are challenging the status quo, who want to bring, you know, who are oftentimes are oppressed and want to win. 
win rights. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's a bumpy road. And, and so I think the, this history is very instructive for us if you, we want to try to, mm-hmm. try to, uh, to keep a true democracy and, and be vigilant about these things. Paul, do you have a last question for Mark? Well, Mark, if, 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 if there's a question we haven't asked you that you would, would you tell us what it is and then answer it? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> Uh, let me think about that. A question you haven't asked me. Well, I'm, like us to have I'm curious about the difference, and we only have about a minute, so briefly, okay. the difference between writing this book and your normal feature writing investigative reporting. Well, of course, just the, 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 the length, for one, is so much longer. Um, you know, it's I, I've done a lot of, you know, investigations in Memphis of, you know, political corruption basically i guess that's you know was my bread and butter for years um but uh i mean it's just it's just the length of time all the all the footnoting and end noting end noting you know we don't we don't we we write it down in notebooks and stuff in in, in to keep our sources straight in, in journalism but here you know it's oh boy, it's a laborious process of you know making sure you got you know trying to be academic about it and and properly source everything you know that that was a whole project in and of itself we thank you for addressing a subject that needed to be, and we don't. We hope this is this is your first book, but we certainly hope it's not your last. Well, uh, convince my wife, and it might be my. Uh, my I might have another book in me. We'll see. <laughs> and just one one last question: At what point did you know that you were going to be able to get this published? <sighs> you know, it got kind of. It didn't really come together until last summer. Oh, um, wow. So you worked on it yeah, for because, years and years. Well, with, with, I, I worked on it. I worked on it wholeheartedly for three years, from 2014 to 2017. I had a, an original publisher, and it was a small publishing house in South Carolina, and they went out of business on me, and I was left kind of like scrambling, going, "What am I going to do?" I mean, <laughs> it, it was it was very. I mean, it was just part of this whole thing, though. Like I said, it was just this huge uphill battle all the way. And, you know, I felt lot, oftentimes like it was a conspiracy against me because it just didn't seem like it was possible to do it. And how how did you? I mean, Melville House is a very you know great publisher. How did you find them? I think well, I I found them. I of course I'd heard about them, but then I had a colleague who told me about them, and I tried to work some some angles there. But I mean, I think it was just one of these things where everything lined up because you know the publishers there, Dennis Johnson. I mean, they're very progressive. I mean, I, I, they, when they saw this, they saw something that other people didn't see. I mean, and I, you know, it's that old story. I mean, people shutting doors on you. They, they, didn't, they don't, they don't think this is anything worth hmm. publishing, but they did. I mean, and I'm glad they did. I'm <laughs> so grateful. Well, congratulations. Um, Thank you so much. Yes, and uh, recommend a spy in Canaan: How the FBI used a famous photographer to infiltrate the civil rights movement. Thank you, Paul, for joining us today. And um, although my mother's not here and she usually gives the quote at, to end the program, I have a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. There is some good in the worst of us and some evil in the best of us. When we discover this, we are less prone to hate our enemies. See you next week on Writer's Voices. Thank you so much.